Welcome back to Econ 103, Introduction to Microeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at how to apply an excise tax and the calculations to find all the different variables associated with it. The expectation with this video is that you've already taken a look at our price controls video. You've already have an understanding of what an excise tax is, how it's applied to our curves, and you're here just for the walkthrough for the mathematical side of it. For the video, we already have the assumption that the equilibrium has been solved and we already have the consumer surplus, producer surplus, and social surplus at this allocatively efficient equilibrium already determined for us. If you are having troubles with this, please go back to the walkthrough on price floors as we solve this initial equilibrium and the initial surplus in that video. For this video, we will just be kicking off from that point, applying the excise tax, working out the new prices, working out the new quantities, and conducting our welfare analysis. We will finish off by figuring out who pays the burden of the tax and taking a look at the elasticity of supply and the elasticity of demand to see how we would calculate those and how we make that comparison. So let's jump over, let's get started. So here we have our initial case. We have our curves of interest. We have our demand curve as price equals 110 minus 2Q. We have our supply curve as 10 plus 3Q. And we have our initial market clearing price of 70 and the corresponding allocatively efficient level of quantity exchanged of 20. We similarly have our consumer, producer, and social surplus. Again, keeping in mind, consumer is just willingness to pay above the price. So this triangle yielding our consumer and producer above our willingness to accept below the price, this triangle being our producer. Together, our two agents of interest being just the consumer and the producer gives us society. So we get our social surplus all together. In our scenario here, what we want to do is we want to put on an excise tax. And in our scenario, we're going to put on an excise tax of $10 per unit. So keeping in mind what this does, an excise tax does not shift the supply curve. We would say an excise tax augments the supply curve. And as this is a per unit tax, it is a parallel shift of the curve or an augmentation of the curve rather. That is for every quantity, the supply curve is gonna sit $10 higher. So let's go through and draw that uh, to the best that I can. We'll say that that is a parallel shift. So I would have my supply plus tax. Again, keep in mind with that, big, big thing here is that this vertical distance here so vertical distance between these two lines, that is the size of my tax, so that is $10. And this is true no matter where I pick this vertical distance. That vertical distance always has to be the size of my tax. That means this is also true right here, that this vertical distance must also be $10, which means my new supply plus tax line, that must have an intercept of $10, right? That's the $10 difference by imposing this tax. Okay, so now that the tax is imposed, we have what is seen by the market as our new equilibrium. And the market witnesses this new equilibrium, that is us consumers, witness a new equilibrium where the demand intersects our tax line. So let's just identify that. Where the demand intersects our tax line, yields for us a quantity, we'll call this our quantity tax. And then at this point here, we are gonna get what I will call, oh, let's try to make that a straight line here. There we go, that's a bit better. I will call this my price tax. That is gonna be the new price that we now have to pay because the tax was put into place. Keep in mind, even though we pay this price to the cashier when we're at the store, the firm doesn't actually get to keep the entire amount of PT. From the firm's perspective, the price has actually fallen. 
because sure they get PT at the cashier, but they have to remit vertical distance, the size of the tax, meaning all that they actually get to keep is down here. So we pay PT, they actually receive down here. From their point of view, the price of their good has actually fallen and we get the price that the producer receives. So price producer. Or again, hey, that's just the vertical distance between these two. So of course, the difference between our price producer and the price underneath the tax, that's gonna be our $10, right? Our actual size of the tax here. So what we have going on there. So that's our initial setup. Let's go and actually start solving for these prices, this new quantity underneath the tax. And in order to do so, what we need to do is we actually need to go and create the new mathematical function for this tax line. And how do we do so? Well, keep in mind that it's just a parallel shift of our supply curve. So same slope, parallel shift is same slope. The only difference is instead of an intercept of 10, we now have an intercept of 20. So our new line, I'll call this price T, because that's my new tax line, is going to be 20 plus 3Q. Okay, so 20 plus 3Q, that's the new supply with the tax, supply plus tax. The other way to think of this, of course, if you're like, oh, I'm really lost as to how we got that 20. Well, hey, all we said is that this is supply plus tax. Supply, well, that was just 10 plus 3Q. The tax, that was just 10, right? So 3Q, that was the supply. 10 was the tax. What do we have? We have 3Q. Okay, that doesn't work. But we have 10 plus 10. So we get 20 plus 3Q as my new supply plus tax, which is, hey, just what we had up there. So two different ways you can think of that for sure. Okay, from here, what we wanna figure out is this new perceived equilibrium, price tax, quantity tax. And to do so, why would we do that? Well, same way we would have calculated this initial equilibrium. We just need to set the curves equal to each other. And what we have to recognize is that at this price tax, quantity tax equilibrium, that is where our supply tax and our demand curves intersect each other. So we wanna set those two equal. So doing so, we get price tax equals price, and I'll just subscript that demand to say, hey, that's our demand line that we're having there. So price tax, that is 20 plus 3Q equals price demand 110 minus 2Q, okay. We want to do is consolidate our unknown so that's our q and then once it's consolidated we want to isolate it so for me i don't like my negatives so let's get that negative 2q moved over so i'll get 20 plus 5q equals 110. now i want to isolate the q that's a q not a zero so let's get rid of this 20. so move the 20 over 5q equals 90. okay Let's now go and divide by five. So 90 divided by five, that's gonna give me, ah, that's gonna give me 18. So quantity equals 18. And again, what quantity was this? Well, that was where these two lines were intersecting. So that is my quantity under the tax. So QT, that was 18, as my new quantity exchanged under this tax. From here, I need to go figure out my prices. I can either figure out the tax price or the producer price first. It doesn't actually matter which one I do first. Either one is perfectly legitimate to start with. So let's take a look at them. If I wanted to find the producer price first, what I would do is I would take my 18 up to my original supply function across gives me my producer price. So that is 18 into the original supply would give me the price which producers now receive. 
Alternatively, if I wanted to get the price tax, I would take this 18 and I'd put it into either my new supply plus tax line or 18 into my demand curve, right? Because they're both the same at that point. So 18 into either of those and that will yield for me my price tax. In this case, let's go through that latter one. Let's go through and put it into our new augmented supply curve. So I'm going to have my price tax equals 20 plus 3Q. Q is 18. So, okay, what do I get? Price tax equals 20 plus 3 times 18. That's going to be 54. So I'm going to get my price under this tax to be 20 plus 54. That's going to be 74. Again, so in this case, I have it subscripted as PT, so it's pretty clear as to where this goes. But if we had forgotten what we were figuring out and we just had this labeled as P, how would I know where to put this 74? Well, hopefully there's a few ways that we can figure this out. First of all, 74 is bigger than 70. So ideally, it's up here. Otherwise, we used our new augmented tax line. So 18 up to our new augmented tax line gave us this value. So through either of those processes, we can then identify that what we've just calculated is our new 74, the new price paid under the tax. And what we see with this too, is that the difference between the original price and the new price, which consumers pay, is $4. So, hey, our consumers are paying $4 more per unit because this tax is in place. Next step, of course, is let's calculate our producer price. Now, two ways that we can do this now. One's the easy way, one's the hard way. The hard way, and relatively hard, it's not that hard, would be we'd take the 18, we'd put it into the original supply, and we'd get our willingness to accept. We could do that, not too bad at all. Right, we would just go, hey, price equals 10, plus 3Q. Okay, we could work that out. 10 plus 3 times 18, 10 plus 54 is 64. Great, that wasn't bad. The other way to do it, of course, is to realize that, hey, the vertical distance between these two prices is just my tax. So if consumers are paying $74 at the till and $10 of that needs to be remitted to the government, well then, the firm is only keeping $64. 74 being paid, 10 going to the government, 64 left over for the firm. That is, from the firm's perspective, this is the new price that they're receiving. So, hey, we see that their burden, the amount that they end up paying of this, 70 down to 64, the producer is now paying $6 of this tax, right? So that full $10 is being split, $4 being paid by the consumer, $6 by the producer. And we have our outcome of the tax. Okay, what about our surplus analysis? Well, let's conduct that next. And for the surplus analysis, let's just begin by talking and walking through each of the components, and then we will actually go through and calculating them. So ultimately, we'll be looking for our new consumer surplus, consumer surplus one, our new producer surplus, producer surplus one, and our new social surplus, and we'll call that social surplus one, just to keep with the naming convention. What we have to keep in mind though, is that actually, this is not our entire list. Initially, we only had consumers and producers as players in the market. In this scenario though, we have added a tax, that is, we have added our government into the mix. And that is the government is now taking a share of this market. So we need to now include them when we're conducting our welfare analysis and when we're trying to solve for our social surplus. So going through it, starting off with our consumer surplus. Below our willingness to pay, above the price we do pay. So keeping in mind, our consumer is paying this higher price. That is the price they witness, the price tax. 
So we get that blue little triangle there as our consumer surplus. Our producers, our producers, well, so that's below the price that we actually receive. So that's the 64 above our willingness to accept. And common mistake that ends up happening here is that we take our new supply line and we say, hey, look, this little tiny triangle here, this is my producer surplus. But it's not. Don't do that. The reason why the supply line was augmented rather than shifted is because the firm's willingness to accept has not changed. In that sense there, their willingness to accept is still that original supply line. So above their willingness to accept to our quantity exchanged, below the price received. So below our 64. All together, that triangle there, that yields for us our producer surplus. Okay, we have some left over here. What is this left over? Well, in this case, we have this middle rectangle. Keeping in mind the height of this rectangle is my tax per unit, right? 74 minus 64, that's $10 per unit. We are then selling 18 units. So $10 per unit over 18 units. This is the total tax revenue being collected by the government. And I know people, uh, they want to complain about taxes and oh, taxes are a bad thing. But in this case, keep in mind why the government collects taxes. It's not just to line their pockets. This tax revenue is to be redistributed back to the public to provide public services. So from society's perspective, it is a positive. So three different areas, three different players for us to compute. Let's go through and do this. Starting off with consumer surplus. We just have a triangle. That's pretty easy. One half base of 18 times the height 110 minus 74. So what do we have there? That's going to be 36 if my mental math is serving me right. Okay, working that out. One half times 18 times 36 gives me a consumer surplus of 324. Great. Jumping down to the next one, producer surplus. Again, this is just a triangle. We look like we have two triangles, but hey, together they just make one big one. So one half, base of 18, height of 10 all the way to 64. So that's a height of 54. If we work through that, one half 18 times 54 equals 486 as my producer surplus. We then have our government revenue. So, okay, government revenue, that's our yellow box. That's just our rectangle. That is a base of 18, 18 units bought and sold. We're collecting a tax of $10 per unit. So we have $180 worth of tax revenue being collected. Social surplus then, well, our social surplus is just the sum of the surplus of all of our players. So 180 plus 486 plus 324, that gives me altogether a social surplus of 990. So $990 of social surplus being received altogether. In this case here, Keep in mind, anytime that we have this loss in social surplus, we used to have 1,000, we now have 990. The resulting is a dead weight loss. So our dead weight loss is that surplus, I'm shading that in with this brown triangle, what we used to be able to receive, and now that's lost due to our policy being enacted. And so in this scenario, we have a dead weight loss equal to 1,000 minus 990 we have a $10 deadweight loss. Okay, so who are our winners? Who are the losers and what has happened all together? So starting off with our consumers, used to have 400, used to, now they get 324. So, okay, our consumers, they have lost their sad. Producers, used to get 600, now get 486. Producers, they're upset, they have lost. Government, 
well, government used to get nothing. So government in this scenario, they're now collecting, they're winning. So yay, go government. And society on whole, well, society loses. You used to get a thousand altogether. We now only get 990. So we see really in this why taxes are so universally unpopular by everybody because Everybody loses except for the government who ends up just collecting their share. Okay, so that's our welfare analysis of a tax. What we're going to do next is we're going to take a look at the tax burden, who's paying the majority of this tax, and we're going to look at what that means about the elasticities. So that's what we're going to go to next. Let's just clean up our welfare analysis here so that we have some room to work. So working out the tax incidence or the tax burden, we've already seen that with respect to the initial 70, our consumers, they're paying $4 of this tax, while our producers, they used to receive $70, producers now only get 64, so producers, they're paying $6 of this tax. Together, of course, that is our entire tax of 10. So in this case, we'd say that, yeah, the burden, the tax incidence, that is falling on the producer. Keep in mind that we said that really this determination of tax burden can be shown through relative elasticities. So that is, if we take a look at the elasticity of demand, the elasticity of supply, we said that the one that is relatively inelastic, so the one with the lower elasticity, will face the tax burden. So in this case here, we've just said, hey, the producer is facing it, so this must be the case. That is, if you think of this as an arrow, not an inequality, we are pointing to the one paying the tax. But let's actually calculate this, and let's see if this is actually the case. So. Let's start off with the elasticity of demand. How do we calculate that again? Well, elasticity of demand, that is the percent change in our quantity demanded for a percent change in price. We could also write this, and it's not necessarily as intuitive mathematically, but it's uh, arguably easier when we actually have our equations. We can write this as the change in quantity demanded all over the change in price times our average price all over our average quantity demanded. Similarly, our elasticity of supply looks identical just with S for quantity supplied instead of quantity demanded. So we could quickly write that. Percent change in, oh, that's not a Q. Let's try that again. Percent change in our quantity supplied all over the percent change in the price. And again, we could write this as the change in our quantity supplied all over the change in the price times the average price all over the average quantity supplied. And sorry, I wouldn't put this starting bit of an absolute value sign there. We do not need the absolute value for our supply, elasticity of supply. That only applies to our elasticity of demand. Okay. First case, mathematically a little bit more intuitive. We're measuring just sensitivity to price. And we're saying, okay, what's the percent change in quantity demanded versus the percent change in price? If we have a bigger percent change in quantity, well, then we're sensitive, so we're elastic. If we have a bigger percent change in price, well, then we're not so sensitive, we'd say we're inelastic. So the first kind of expression there intuitively makes a bit more sense. We can visualize the result before we actually calculate it. Arguably, the second case is a bit easier to calculate when we have a full-on formula being given to us because this expression here, that expression is our marginal effect. Marginal effect. Which, to remind ourselves what the marginal effect is, that's just, hey, if I have a dollar change in the price, how much more good or less good am I going to get? In this sense, 
when we have our supply and demand equations written as price equals a function of Q, our marginal effect is just the inverse of our slope. So that is in this scenario here, we would have a marginal effect for demand, well our slope is two, so our marginal effect would be one half. In the sense of our supply case, our slope is three, so our marginal effect would be one third. Okay, now what we need to do in each of these scenarios is we need to solve for the average price, the average quantity demanded, the average price, the average quantity supplied. So let's go do through that. Let's start off with our demand case. So one thing to recall is that over a linear demand or a linear supply curve, our elasticities are not constant. Depending on where we measure these elasticities, we'll get different values. So which points on the demand curve are we interested in? Well, if we take a look at it, we've actually just moved along two points of our demand curve. We used to be here. We're now here. So that is, we would want to calculate our elasticity of demand between those two points. So starting off with average quantity, we have moved from a quantity of 20 to 18. So okay, average 18 plus 20 divided by two, we would get 19 as our average quantity. Similarly, we would want to figure out the average price. Well, at our initial point, we had a price of 70. We now have a price of 74. So 70 plus 74 divided by two, that's going to give me 72. So I can work through that now. I can go 72 divided by 19 times one half. And that's going to give me my elasticity of demand, which is 1.89. Great. Greater than one, therefore it's saying that my demand is elastic. My demand is sensitive to the price at this point. If it was less than one, we would have said our demand was inelastic. Let's go through and calculate our elasticity of supply now. So again, same thing. We want to just have two points on the supply curve because depending on where we look, we're gonna get different values for our elasticity. In this scenario, we do have two points. We have our initial point, that was the initial equilibrium, and we have our new one, which is our new willingness to accept. So taking a look at that, we can calculate our elasticity of supply between these two points. Okay, average price, average quantity supplied. Let's start off again with our average quantity supplied. We used to supply 20, we're now supplying 18. So average between that, 20 plus 18 divided by two, that gives me again 19 as my average quantity. Average price, I used to get a price of 70, I now get a price of 64. So we have 70 plus 64 divided by two, that gives me an average price of 67. As I go through this, we can calculate our elasticity of supply, 67 divided by 19 times one third. And what we get in this case here is one point, uh, we'll round that to 1.18. So again, we have an elasticity of supply, which is greater than one, which says that my supply curve is elastic. If we had had a elasticity of supply less than one, we would say that it's inelastic or not sensitive to price. Okay, all of this was really just to see, was our statement here actually correct? Right, we said, hey, suppliers, producers are paying the tax burden, therefore the elasticity of supply must be less than the elasticity of demand. Is that actually true? Well, elasticity of demand is 1.89 versus 1.18. So, hey, would you look at that? It is true. 
we do have a case such that supply is relatively inelastic. And that's a big thing. I'm not saying supply is inelastic. I'm saying it's relatively inelastic when we compare it to the demand. Okay, a little bit more complicated, quite a few more steps than when we went through any of the other price controls, that is the price floor, ceiling, or quota. If you have any questions on this, please feel free to comment below. Please feel free to leave a question on the frequently asked questions on D2L, or of course, feel free to reach out to me by email. Thanks. Until next time.